Hello, science enthusiasts. My name is Jason Zakowski, also known as Dad Guy. I'm the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker on social media. Every week in SciChat, we bring you an amazing guest to enthrall you with their area of knowledge, and you get to know them a little bit more outside of what they do. This week, we are absolutely thrilled and delighted that Emily Calandrelli gave up her time. She's super busy to come chat with us today. Uh, We'll do some interview type questions and then we'll open up the floor to the audience to ask questions. We are triple casting right now. So we're on Twitter spaces. We are on Clubhouse and we are on Wisdom. So as long as my tech works out, we're in all three places at the same time. Emily, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. The first question that we ask our guests is, where the heck are you in the world? (laughs) Where Uh, are you? Yes. Yeah. I am in sunny Orange County, California. We actually just moved here a year ago and are just feeling like it's home now. We're settling in a little bit now. Okay. Um, I do get jealous of the weather in California being from Alberta, Canada, I, I you know, like it's a little bit, mm-hmm. a little more temperate. It's not as much as uh, you walk outside and it's so cold you die. So yeah. I am a little jealous about that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm from West Virginia. And so I'm used to like very cold and snowy winters. And now with it just being sunny all the time, I feel like I am never going to leave. It really <laughs> is so nice. I love it. So Emily, your background is in engineering. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I studied, I mean, it's so funny because I, I am like in TV and social media and TikTok now, but I studied engineering for eight years. So my undergrad is from West Virginia University and I studied mechanical and aerospace engineering. And then I went to MIT for my master's and I got one master's in aeronautics and astronautics engineering, and then a second one in something called uh, technology and policy. Right. Now that's a lot of math and that's a lot about space. What was yeah. the what was what got you into it in the first place? Like as a young oh, Emily, were you infatuated with space? Were you were you writing equations at late into the night? Um, oh, I <laughs> wish. I I mean that I when I hear people who have stories like that, I'm so jealous because I think that sounds really beautiful. Um, I was a very practical child. And as a high school senior, I Googled all of the majors that one could major in in college. And I looked at their starting salaries. And (laughs) I saw that engineers, um, on average, like made some of the highest paying salaries after a four year degree. And so that is how I chose to go into engineering. Um, I didn't know any scientists or engineers growing up. Um, but my, my dad grew up in poverty and worked his way up to middle class where my family was. And so I had this like family legacy in the back of my mind of like, oh my gosh, you have to take your family farther. Mm. And, um, I kind of went into engineering thinking it was going to be hard and boring and I was going to hate it, but I was going to end up with a good job in the end. And then as I reluctantly joined it, I learned that a, I was good at it and B, there were so many adventures that you could have as a student studying engineering and science. I got to travel the world. I got to fly in the vomit comet. I um, (laughs) did something called engineers without borders where I got to travel to a different country. I did internships in China. And like, I just got to do all of these wonderful adventures that made me become obsessed with the field. And I just never looked back. So I have to ask you about the vomit comet. Um, Yes, I have. I do believe I've seen a video of you in it. Have you been in the vomit comet more than once? Yes. Yeah, so okay. I all right. It, yeah. Uh, <laughs> in undergrad, I did it for research, and so um, I was part of something called the microgravity research team at West Virginia University. And um, you had to submit a proposal with a science experiment that you wanted to do on board the vomit comet. And if NASA thought it was good enough, then you got accepted. And if you raised enough money, you could go and fly. And so I did that in undergrad. And it was so much fun that uh, once I got my TV show, um, you know, when you're a producer for a TV show, you have some say in as to what you do for that TV show. And so <laughs> uh, I, I chose to go on the Vomit Comet two more times um, <laughs> during that experience. So yeah, I've ridden it a couple of times now. Now the first, obviously three times, did it get old? I look at it and it would be so fun to feel weightless, right? Because it's artificial weightlessness. 
Exactly. So if anybody's listening who hasn't heard of the Vomit Comet, it's a plane that flies in the air like an 8,000 foot roller coaster. It goes up and down and up and down and up and down. And when it goes um, over the hump, but up and down, um, you feel weightless. And then when you go down and up under the hump, you feel really heavy. And so you go through these periods mm-hmm. of weightlessness and then hypergravity and weightlessness and hypergravity, uh, depending on the on the flight campaign generally like 30 times. And so doing that over and over and over again, that's why it's called the vomit comet. Um, Did you get sick, Emily? Uh, yes. Yeah, so oh, on the first oh. flight, um, <laughs> I certainly helped give it its name. And I like, I think it's a good rite of passage to, um, to vomit on the vomit <laughs> comet. Um, but yeah, I did. But uh, it was totally worth it. I like I would fly on it a million more times. It's really lovely. Um, but I think the key thing here is that for any students listening, um, you can fly on it for free, essentially, if you do research on board the Vomit Comet in undergrad. But when you're older, the only way to fly on it is to buy a ticket, which are now like six or seven thousand uh, dollars. Yeah, it's like it's a very it's not really open to many people now. Um, but if you study science, you can do it for free. Or be a producer on a TV show. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> or, or just be on my TV show. <laughs> so from working with uh, your background in engineering through your, your education, you've moved on. When was the switch to TV for you, Emily? Like, was that during your education or did it happen a little bit after? I mean, it happened right after. So yeah. I was graduating from MIT and I got a call from a producer that – um, found me online and literally just said, do you want to be the host of a, a new space TV show? Um, I got really lucky. My undergrad, West Virginia University, sort of treated me like a poster child for the college because um, I was one of the only students to have graduated there with the 4.0 and I won oh, wow. uh, a few national awards. Um, and so they they put me in everything, which was very kind of them. But because I had all this publicity around that that's how um, these this production company found me, um, and so I thought that that sounded like an adventure. And I yeah. thought, you know, if, if being a TV host doesn't work out because I had no training in it, <laughs> I have four degrees in science and engineering to fall back on. So I was like, well, I'll probably be okay. So I said yes. And, you know, that show's been running for the last decade now. Okay. This is Exploration Outer Space. Is that the show right. we're talking about? Okay. Exactly. All right. Exactly. So for people that maybe have never heard of that show, is that is that on Fox? Did I get my background yeah. correct? Okay. That's right. Yeah. Saturday mornings on Fox. It's in, I want to say like 90% of American households mm-hmm. and it's on Amazon Prime. Um, and I, it used to be on Hulu, but yeah, it's on a few different streaming platforms too. So over 10 years, I can imagine you had amazing adventures and gone and done amazing things aside oh from God. the, aside from the vomit comet. Um, <laughs> Is there anything else that sticks out that you'd like to tell people about? Yeah, I mean, and we've covered so many wonderful stories. Um, One of my favorite stories that we covered was the Gallaudet Group, which is this group of um, 14 deaf men who helped NASA get to the moon. Um, They were deaf because they had some inner ear damage, and that inner ear damage Um, Our inner ear is something that is responsible for helping us balance our inner ear fluid, depending on how it's spinning, tells us which direction we're moving. Mm -hmm. Um, And sometimes when that inner ear fluid is spinning in a different direction than what our eyes perceive our movement to be, that difference causes us to be motion sick. But when you have inner ear damage, you don't have... um, that same motion sickness, which gives you the superpower for doing these really intense tests that NASA wanted to do on humans to figure out what would happen to humans when they go to um, go to space. And so these deaf men from Gallaudet uh, University uh, were put through all of these tests to showcase what humans could go through. Um, and they that test kind of helped us figure out um, how to bring humans into space. And so we got to cover that story, which was really amazing. We went to Russia one year and went to um, the Yuri Gagarin Cosmonaut oh, Training so Center. Cool. Mm-hmm. It was, I got to ride in a human centrifuge, which is what you know NASA astronauts and, and Russian cosmonauts ride in to test G-forces on their body. It was so cool. And we you know, <laughs> I've scuba dived down to habitats um, under the ocean. I've gone a uh, mile underground to 
um, a lab where it's been this like abandoned gold mine and you have to go in a cage and it's like a 10 minute elevator ride down to the lab. I've <laughs> jumped out of planes. I've gone in aerobatic flights. I've gone in um, done acrobatic flights and test planes that haven't been approved by the FAA. Just so many different adventures that I'd never would have imagined I um, would have gone on as, you know, studying to be an engineer uh, when I was in college. So it sounds like you say yes to a lot of the things. Um, <laughs> do you ever regret some of the things you've said yes to? Like you're oh like, oh, I don't know if I should have, uh, but when it's done, you're like, wow, that'll make a good show kind of thing. I know. <laughs> yes. I think, I think the scuba diving one, um, was one of those ones that in the moment I was like, why did I say yes to this? <laughs> I have a fear of being in the dark deep ocean. <laughs> why did I think that I was going to be okay with it just because I'm on camera? Um, that one, I actually had a panic attack right before I went underwater because I have this fear of going underwater in the ocean. And um, I am scuba trained, but because my scuba training was like so scary, I'd never gone since I had been trained mm. um, and decided that the next time to do it was going to be on my show <laughs> um, with cameras around. And Ooh. so everybody has to see me have a panic attack and then, you know, calm myself down to be able to go um, under the water and do the job and, and get the footage. So it, it ended up being okay. And I felt really brave afterwards. But yeah. that was one in the moment that I was like, mm, I mean, let's maybe rethink some of the shoots that we're going to do in the future. <laughs> it would be jumping out of a plane for me. I don't do well with mm -hmm. heights, but um, I love swimming and snorkeling and, and diving deep. But mm -hmm. I think if I went up into a plane, somebody would have to like roundhouse kick me out of the door. Otherwise, I would oh, not yeah. be leaving. It's so funny. I feel like I've gotten like less brave as I've gotten older. Maybe I just feel like I have more to lose now or something. <laughs> um, but I, I've done skydiving when I was younger, when I um, like was a NASA intern at uh, NASA Glenn in Cleveland. Um, uh, the interns, we all went skydiving together. And I just remember it being like the most fun, like thrilling thing I'd ever done. And then when I did it for my show, I was freaking out. <laughs> I just, I, I hated it. And I was oh. like, I never want to do this again. So with, okay. So two, just two follow-up questions before we get to your, the Netflix show that is our niece's favorite show right now. Um, oh. <laughs> um, when, okay. So with your show, with exploration, outer space, you do these things, but it's always a teachable moment, right? Like, um, do you work backwards from the science to the thing that you do? Or do you start with the thing and then try to find the science in it? Oh, yeah. Well, we always start with the, the theme of the episode. Okay. So with every episode, there's often um, a theme that we want to cover, whether it be like extreme planets or um, like science underground or um, inclusive stories. And then we try to find four segments that would fit within um, that topic. And so then we go out and get four different stories, usually at four different locations. Um, and mm. if it... Like when we are deciding which, what segments to do, we're always trying to make it as visual and active as possible. Right. Because when you're on TV, like you can't just find a really interesting science story. It has to also be visual in some way. I have to be able to show the viewer something fun or bring them along on the ride. Like when I – we did one that in the moment I thought was a little bit silly, but it ended up being really fun for the viewers. Um, I went to an amusement park with an astronaut and we just rode a bunch of different amusement park rides. Oh, fun. <laughs> yeah. I talked about how the G forces on these different roller coasters and amusement park rides were similar to the G forces that you experience, um, when riding a rocket to space or mm. when you're in or in orbit around the earth. And so we got to kind of use something that felt familiar to a lot of kids who might be watching and translate that mm -hmm. into a, something a bit bigger. Yeah, um, my my day job, I teach high school science and uh, the physics teachers take the kids on a fit, you know, a field trip. This is like uh, grade 11, 12. I'm not sure what that is in the States. They're mm -hmm. something, something in the States. You've got like four different names for grades nine through 12. Oh, I'm, yeah. Junior, senior. There we go. Those ones. I don't know. You have to watch like an American drama and they're like, I'm a sophomore and sophomore shouldn't date juniors. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. That means nothing <laughs> to me. Anyways. <laughs> Um, yeah, so they take the kids to an amusement park in West Edmonton Mall, um, and it's it's amazing. They do physics and calculations, and they get to ride the ride, so it's engaging, and they all learn something from it, too. So I, I yeah. totally get it. 
Yeah, it just feels it, it makes it all feel a bit more relatable, I think. Yeah. So the other question I have is with your with all of your work with that show and and the, the obviously obviously the background research that goes into it. Um I just have a curious question with G forces and centrifugal forces and inner eardrum imbalances, is that something some people are just born better at or can you be trained? Can you train yourself not to get dizzy or pukey? Um under Ooh, that I- <laughs> I I have no idea. I, yeah. I mean, okay. I, just, I, I was I, just curious. I don't know. Yeah. I, I suspect that there are some people that are like just more inclined to be better at that. And I know that as you get older, it's easier to get more motion sick. And I don't exactly know why that is. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. There's definitely medicine that you can take because there is physics behind it. I mean, a lot mm. of it is like what I mentioned before with the inner ear fluid, when your inner ear fluid is spinning in one direction, like if you are in a chair and that chair is spinning, then your inner ear fluid will start to spin as well. Yeah. And then when you stop that chair, your body stops but your fluid that has momentum is continuing <laughs> to spin a little bit. Yep. And so that's why when you stop, the world still feels a little bit wobbly because that inner ear fluid is telling you like, oh, no, you're still moving. But your eyes are like, wait, no, I'm not. And so that difference in uh, inputs makes you feel sick. Um, and so if you you can take medicine to dampen that uh, reflex. And so when you go on the vomit comment, they'll often give you some sort of shot or medicine to take mm. to um, make you feel a little bit less motion sick. <laughs> I found that as I get older, um, like if I do a flip into the pool, because uh, I used to be a competitive swimmer, I would jump into the pool oh, all wow. the time, right? Um, and I, if you do a flip in the pool, like back then, I would just like yeet myself into the pool. No big deal, right? Like jump <laughs> off the diving board and just go crazy. But mm-hmm. now as an older dude, if I do a front flip into the pool, it's like my life is flashing before my eyes. Like I get in there like, which way is up? I'm going to die. I'm going to drown. Um, and it's just because I'm so dizzy from doing that yep. flip into the pool, which is uh-huh. it. Yeah, you're making that inner ear fluid yeah. spin a little we do fast. we do that with kids at school too. We we uh we go around we collect all the spinny chairs from all the teachers in biology and we just whip have them whip each other around and it makes for a good teachable moment when they get up <laughs> and fall over. So plus me <laughs> it's kind of it's a little bit yeah, a little bit of revenge on the students. They have fun and then they whoa, a little dizzy. Um <laughs> Great. So um, the next qu- the next uh, question I have for you is about Emily's Wonder Lab. Yeah, it's this amazing show for people that don't know. And we're gonna I'll, uh, you can talk about it, and you'll do a better job than me. But it's this amazing show on Netflix where you break down this cool sciencey thing, and you do experiments with kids. And there's always really a big, big experiment that goes with it. And uh, Chris is my wife. She's the co-host. She was with uh, our son's band on the way to a band competition. And our niece was watching you on her iPad. And uh, Chris, what did you say to Ellie? Um, go ahead. Uh, yes, I said, oh, my goodness. I said, Ellie, um, Emily is going to be on our Twitter spaces. <laughs> and um, does your mom have Twitter? Because she can listen in on Twitter. With you. <laughs> I know. And then Emily's like, or and then um, Ellie was like, oh, OK. <laughs> she had no idea. She's like, OK. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, no, this is a really big deal. This is like so cool. So, That's so sweet. yeah, I, I was pretty adorable. Um, and my question is, well, I guess it's not really a question, but I'd love for you to talk to us about Emily's Wonder Lab in whichever way you'd like. Yeah. Um, man, that's probably been my favorite project I've ever worked on, mostly because it just, it felt like it resonated with so many people and it had the effect that we were intending it to have, which when you do these types of projects, ICOM projects, um, you always have this expectation of what you hope the response will be. Um, and sometimes that aligns and sometimes it doesn't. And this is one of those instances where it just, it hit the way that you wanted it to. Um, so I had been pitching a, a kid's show for years with um, one of my friends who's a producer or was a producer at Buena Murray. And we had pitched around to all the major kids net, uh, networks. And we actually had gotten it to the pilot stage with oh. a, a certain network um, that people would have heard of. <laughs> and once we shot the pilot, the feedback was, oh, this is too sciencey for our audience. Um, and so they didn't move forward with it, which was really disappointing. And um, 
a few years later after that, we got a call from Netflix who had heard of the pitch and said that they wanted us to come and pitch it to them. And so we went in and they loved it. And I got the call that not only did they want the show, but they were totally fine with me filming it nine months pregnant. <laughs> I know. Um, I know. I didn't want to bring that up. I was, that's just oh incredible. My it was so, I was so, I mean, they actually, they gave me the decision as to whether or not I wanted to film before or after the baby came. Um, and this was my first child. And I was like, I don't know what it's like to have a kid. I hear it's pretty hard. So let's <laughs> do this before the baby comes. And we filmed it all within a week um, while I was nine months pregnant. And those overalls that I wore in the show just got tighter and tighter each day. <laughs> um, and it was wonderful. It was magic that after the show came out, um, Kids all over the country were um, having science themed birthday parties that they were making like uh, Sophia's Wonder Lab themed birthday parties, Alex's Wonder Lab themed birthday parties. Um, during Halloween, kids were dressing up as me um, because they wanted to be a scientist. And all these parents were messaging me, thanking me for the show. And it was just the most wonderful thing. I went to a Fourth of July block party Um just this weekend and there were kids on the block that came up to me and they were like, are you Emily from Emily's wonder lab? Uh. And I was like, this will never get old. This is my favorite thing. <laughs> um, and so it's, yeah, it's been really lovely that that shows my, um, my favorite thing I've ever worked on. That is so adorable. Um, from, from your show, I think a lot of teachers are using it as teachable moments in elementary too, because that's one of the things when I like I I I uh, go to teachers conventions and I put on this is how you can do science and I make it easy enough for our, our elementary school teachers to do that and I feel your show is just that perfect like excitement but also tangible ability to do that with young kids because you you work with little kids well not like little little kids but yeah. you just show that it's possible it's possible to do science and have it be fun and that's yeah. it's so cool. And I think like giving the kids agency to be curious and empowered to ask questions and mm. not talking down to them, really giving them a little bit of trust to um, figure out the the science as you go along and trusting them with um, asking questions and making hypotheses and make just making them feel involved. Um, cause I, there's, it's hard to find science content that's like that. A lot of it is very prescriptive and um, sometimes it can just be like, here's the science and you can memorize it. But I think with the kids in the show, we had this opportunity to make it more interactive and encourage those questions. And so the kids watching at home can sort of see themselves. And I call them my little scientists, my little <laughs> scientists in the show. And then hopefully when they stop watching, they can go about their day and feel curious and empowered to ask questions about the world around them too. Oh, I love that. Was there, I, I, I'm just a little stunned that you filmed that in a week. That's incredible. It, the planning that must have went into that must have been oh, yes. <laughs> pretty, pretty wild to get it all to go back oh, to yeah. back to back. So I, I feel, I think I probably spent six weeks to two months, um, just like writing out all the different science experiments that we could possibly do and working with a team to narrow it down to the ones that, you know, we could do within the time frame of a 10 minute TV show um, that could be big enough and colorful enough and bold enough for a Netflix TV show. <laughs> um, something that we can make into a game, um, something that we could just make really a fun for kids. Um, and then we just practiced all of those science experiments because with anything science related, you know, that's not always going to go according to plan. So we tried to prepare as much as we could. Uh, and so that we could try to film two episodes a day, which ended up being a lot, but we got it done. Each year, an average of 10 tropical storms develops over the Atlantic Ocean, the Caribbean Sea, and the Gulf of Mexico. Six of those become hurricanes, and roughly five strike the United States coastline. Every week during hurricane season, we talk with tropical weather scientists, forecasters, hurricane hunters, and broadcasters, and hurricane chasers. Hear their thoughts and stories about their research, forecasts, and experiences with hurricanes on the Hurricane Center podcast.
can't imagine how tired you would have been. This is, oh my is, gosh. It's incredible. Yes. I was surviving on adrenaline and nerds. Nerds was like my candy of choice um, when I was nine <laughs> months pregnant. And so I would just go back to my green room and like lay horizontal and oh my shove nerds into my mouth and then get ready for the next uh, for the next filming session. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, Chris, what was the thing you were addicted to uh, with with Duncan, our first son? Um, Slurpees. Oh yeah. Slurpees. Mm -hmm. Slurpees. Watermelon Slurpees. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. We all had our thing. I mean, I've never eaten so many nerds in my life. <laughs> oh my goodness. Is there an experiment or something from Emily's wonder lab that is your favorite? Like, is there, or oh, were, yeah. is there? Yeah. Oh yeah. Ooblek. Ooblek is my favorite one. It, one, it's like the most inclusive one, I, in my opinion, because it requires, um, only one, really ingredient that you probably have at home, cornstarch. And so you just add cornstarch and water and you have this like very fun, weird <laughs> substance that's called a non-Newtonian fluid. And then my favorite part as a parent is that it is super easy to clean up. Um, my daughter will play with it for an hour and she'll get it absolutely everywhere. And then I just let it dry. It becomes cornstarch again and you just vacuum it up and it, it's just so easy to clean. So um, <laughs> yeah, Ooblek. Ooblek is my favorite one. I love that. Uh, high school kids go bananas for Ooblick as well. Um, mm. Anything slime related, you like, you know, some really tired grade 12 kid. I've got chemistry in the morning and go out there. I'm like, okay, we're going to be mixing eye solution with glue. And they're like, I don't know. And then it turns into this amazing polymer that they're yes. just little kids again. They're like, oh my goodness, it's slime. What is going on? Yeah. And then you... It's such a fun sensory experience. <laughs> like you forget how fun it is just to play with something that feels weird. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, the scale of the stuff you made uh, is pretty incredible. Um, did you have for your show some, <laughs> like, I, I, I don't know anything about TV, but from listening to The Office Ladies, um, that's a, a guilty pleasure of mine oh, I, yeah. I, with podcasting. Uh, <laughs> Um, they have, they always mention their prop master and the prop master had to go get stuff for the show. Mm -hmm. Did you have one? And you're like, we need 10,000 pounds of cornstarch. Oh and, my gosh. And yeah. the, the prop the master prop was like, department. what did you say? Excuse me? What? <laughs> yes. Like our art department was just absolutely top notch. The, <laughs> the set that they created for my lab was so beautiful. These people are like equal equally talented in both art and engineering because it kind of takes both skill sets to figure out how to create these things. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of iteration and innovation that happened here when we were <laughs> making our indoor tornado. It took us a long time to figure out exactly how to make it work. And I had to remember um, like my past trips to museums when I saw indoor tornadoes at museums and tried to think like, how did they do it? How, how do we make our own in this um, in this little lab of mine. And so, yeah, they were very, very creative. They ended up getting like something like 10,000 eggs for the egg episode. They had to get um, like just pounds and pounds and pounds of cornstarch to make a pool full filled with food. Like, and yeah. I have no idea what they did with it after it was done. Cause that's just like, that's so much oobleck. I don't know. Can you just throw that away? I have no idea what they did with it. I guess enough water. It would, you could put it down the drain. Yeah, you yeah, could, with a lot, a lot of water. The solution to dilution is pollute, or solution to pollution is dilution. I guess. There uh -huh. you go. I've never heard that before. That's great. That, <laughs> yeah, that's really great. Um, well, it's great and it's not great. When it's how we, uh, it's how like in the fifties and sixties they taught um, the, the the solution to all kinds of pollution was just to throw it in the ocean <laughs> oh, <laughs> because okay. the, the big enough body of water, it would dilute anything they thought. Right. So, uh -huh. right. It was before we knew about, you know, heavy metals and biomagnification and all that bad stuff. All right. I take it back. It's not great. <laughs> well, it is cute, right? Anything that it rhymes. It is certainly cute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, uh, when the, the Netflix show kind of wrapped, did you keep anything from the set? Oh, I wish I kept more things, to yeah. be honest. I, I was so exhausted after mm. the last day of filming that I threw the overalls away. Oh, no. 
I know I should have kept him. I don't know why I did. I was, I think I was just like so exhausted and so ready to just like be a beached whale in my house and wait for the baby to come that I was like, okay, just get me home. Um, but I did, I kept, um, my, I have a lab coat from the show. I kept a few of the smaller, um, things we made a, like a hovering, disc on one of the episodes it was kind of like a hockey puck we made it with a cd um i kept that and a few other things that mostly just have a lot of pictures a lot of like behind the scenes pics with the kids because we had so much fun making this and the kids were just adorably cute because they're i mean they're like they're real kids they're they're kids who want to have fun and you could um you could see how much joy they were having day in day out like playing with the slime and with the <laughs> oog like and walking on eggs and um we were all working but it was definitely like it was so much fun yeah if you watch the show you can see it's real joy with those kids yeah Ob- obviously i think they probably passed some kind of like acting filter um but right. kid, but kids are kids right, right? <laughs> yep oh yeah they're all uh kid actors in la for sure but um, they, they seem to really love the science. So it was great to work with them. Now only one season of Emily's wonder lab. Um, and there was a big groundswell to bring it back. Like I remember you were tweeting about yes. that. You know, there's like a big social media response to that. Like, uh, I think we retweeted it and we're like, bring back Emily's wonder lab. Um, has, is yeah. there any, I know this might be frustrating, uh, but is there any talk about a second season or, or, or is that kind of that chapter's over and you're moving on with other pursuits? I Well, it's definitely not over. I think the conversation is always on the table and there is always an option for them to continue the show. Okay. Um, and I, I have hopes that eventually it will. I, I think that it has done so well that um, I would love to work with Netflix again to keep it going. Um, but that being said, I'm definitely doing my own thing and making books and pitching other TV shows and things like that. And so there's definitely more projects in the works. I'm hoping to make my Ada Lace book series a TV show. I have oh. um, an animated show that I'm working with Laughing Dragon Studios on when that we're pitching. I mean, I'm wanting to start a podcast perhaps soon that is a children's focused podcast. So I have other projects in the works, other irons in the fire. Um, but I think that there is always a possibility for a season two. Well, we'll be there watching it if it happens. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Emily. Um, and I, I really would like to re- extend a thank you for being such an inspiration um, to everyone, especially as a woman in STEM and how you promote science and make it accessible. And I'm really excited about the new pursuits that you are doing. Um, one thing that you are doing recently is that you have such a large social media platform and you've been using it to speak out about reproductive rights for women in light of the Roe versus Wade ruling in the United States. We'd love to give you an opportunity to talk about that right now if you're interested in talking about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that this the writing has been on the wall for a long time um, with Roe versus Wade. It was a promise that Trump made right in the beginning. And it was something that we thought that would never happen. Um, I say we, I, it's sort of like a, a, some of us were very worried that this might happen um, and were made to feel kind of crazy for um, thinking that. And then of course it does. And so now I think a lot of us are trying to figure out what we can do because all of this is incredibly scary. At first, the argument is that, you know, now abortion isn't protected at the federal level the let's just bring it back to the states and then each state can decide. Um, but then there are laws that are being proposed like in Missouri where somebody who is from Missouri could get sued if they left the state to get an abortion, um, quote unquote, to protect Missourians, Missourians. And so like, it's, uh, very scary to be a person with the uterus in the United States right now. Um, it's, it's like, it's such a nuanced issue that it's hard to cover everything on TikTok. I've tried to, um, to, to address like all these different factors that make it way more nuanced than people would like to, um, presume. I think when you're pro-life, um, you don't want to think too much about nuance. You care about um, unborn babies, which I can kind of understand, you know, where they're coming from. But in my 
mind. That is a spiritual question. When you ask, where does life begin? That's a spiritual question, not a science question. Um, and so we're kind of allowing the government to dictate our, uh, uh, our uterus and these, these decisions that impact all of our lives. And it impacts, um, people of color more and here in the United States, it impacts people without privilege here in the United States. Um, because when you can't travel to get an abortion, when you can't travel to another state, um, you know, that impacts people without resources the most. And so it's a very scary situation here in the United States. And I'm mostly just trying to figure out the best way to attack it right now. Um, I've just been donating to a lot of different abortion funds. When somebody um, writes some anti-pro-choice comment on my Facebook page, I find out what state they're from and I just donate to the abortion fund in their state. Um, That's phase one. Phase two of (laughs) my social media madness is going to be um, identifying the right campaigns to donate to and support because what's going to happen is because this is being left up to the states, now um, these state level um, positions are becoming way more important. And so um, specifically right now, and I'll I'll, uh, explain this later on social media, the two main campaigns that I'm going to be supporting um, are the the, uh, Goober National, the governor campaigns in Pennsylvania and in Michigan. Because if you look um, based on uh, the abortion laws per state, um, many uh, many states are just pl- like flat out banning abortion. There are a number of states that uh, abortion is going to be in question. Like we're not exactly sure. It, it's a threat um, to uh, the rights in those states. And among the states that um, abortion rights are threatened, Pennsylvania and Michigan, because they have so many people there, if you can protect abortion rights in those two states, you can protect 25 percent of the individuals um, who have abortion rights uh, that uh, are threatened um, because their their population is so large. Twenty five. It'll cover 25 percent of um, the people with uteruses of reproductive age whose abort, uh, abortion rights are threatened. And so anyways, um, long, this is, I'm being very long winded about no, this. But no, no, go <laughs> ahead. Take the time that you'd like. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but essentially, um, if you're looking for a campaign to support in the United States, the governor races in Pennsylvania and Michigan are the ones that throw your support behind, throw your votes behind, throw your money behind. That's what I'll be doing. Um, there's a lot of smaller races that are incredibly important too. But um, when I was trying to figure out how my money can make the most impact, go the farthest, um, I wanted to identify states that had um, governor races where abortion rights were on the line. A governor can protect abortion rights for six years. That's a, that's a long time. That's great. Um, and I wanted to find states that had um, a lot of people in them. And so Pennsylvania and Michigan are the two that I'll be supporting. Hmm. But yeah, but lots to say on this um, in the future, but that's, um, that's where I'm at right now. Ever notice when you go outside, there are all those birds chirping and flapping around out there? What's their deal? Well, find out with me, Ivan Philipson, on the Science of Birds podcast. We cover topics like bird behavior, anatomy, evolution, and conservation. Sometimes the focus is on one group of birds, or even a single species. If you're into birds, or if you just love learning about nature, the Science of Birds podcast might be just perfect for you. Find the link in the show notes or go to scienceofbirds.com. I think, I think like Chris and I are just, you know, we're Canadian and we're just look, we're just heartbroken and puzzled. Like, um, I don't know what else to say, but I'm, I, I did see your tit, like we follow you on TikTok and the one TikTok that resonated with me was, um, you're using a trend video, trend, trend sound. And then it's like, you put on your lab coat and you're like, I guess it's me, right? I guess <laughs> I'm the person, I'm one of the people that is speaking about this and um, yeah and, it's, and, and, it's and I just want you to know you're not alone you're not alone yeah thank you for saying that and it's it's a funny situation because I would say that um my account is getting a lot of attention right now but I'm late to the party women of color in particular have been 
talking about this for a very long time. Um, people of color in general have been fighting for their rights for a very long time. So I think right now is kind of an uncomfortable situation for a lot of people seeing all of these women, primarily white women, being like, let's let's fight for our rights now. And mm. a lot of black people in America were like, you know, where have you been? We have been trying to do this for a very long time. Welcome to the party. And so America is just in a very uncomfortable state right now. And we have a lot of work to do, <laughs> to put it lightly. Well, I'm, I, if anything, giving you a chance to talk on Twitter. And I mean, we are simulcasting to three different platforms right now. So the message is out there um, more than I, I don't know what else to say, but uh, thank you for sharing your, your, your thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, thank you for letting me. I appreciate the platform to do that. Well, Emily, um, can we take some questions from the audience? Are you okay with that? Yes, I'd love to. Yay. That's kind of the cool thing about these Twitter spaces is they're, they're interactive. Now, a couple ground rules, folks. Uh, obviously, if you are a locked account... Um, you ain't getting up to the stage. Uh, so we're, we're only going to let speakers that we um, we go through and we verify as not being a troll account up to ask questions. We'll try and keep the questions on topic. Um, if you've seen Emily's Wonder Lab or Exploration Outer Space or any of the stuff that Emily's done, I'm sure she'd be comfortable ask, answering questions about that. Um, and generally stuff about space. Your, your TikToks are very knowledgeable about that. So if you'd like to ask some questions um, on any of our three different simulcast uh come on up here chris is getting some folks ready thank you chris i had to run this last night by myself that was really tough chris not having a co-host <laughs> well adam is important to me and i know I'm, you're at the band I'm really thing excited, uh to share what emily is sharing because um he's actually interested in engineering and he's looking at uh, post-secondary he'll be in grade 12 his final year of high school next year but um, above and beyond he's looking at Simon Fraser University and as much as that hurts my heart that he'll be leaving home leaving the nest I'm really excited about him where um, is he going what did you say he wants to go to Simon Fraser okay that's fine in engineering that's fine. but that might change that might change but I'm just really excited <laughs> Um, and then I can share, uh, what Emily was talking about and then he can listen to the podcast, uh, or the, the Twitter space, but he, right now he's busy being a marching show band, uh, tuba player. So, uh, he has a busy week with Calgary Stampede. So he's, he's doing that first, but Hey, yeah, you know what uh, I'm most excited about with Adam next year? What? Is he's not going to be in my chem class. That was awkward. <laughs> he, he might. <laughs> no, he's not. I checked the schedule. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, he, he goes to school, the same big s school I teach at, and it just, mm -hmm. he, he actually picked my class. So that was, it's very awkward to have your teenage son in your own class. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> it, it's amazing. Because um, he's heard all your jokes, and he yeah. knows what stories It's the worst. Life. He just rolls his eyes instead of laughing. It's, it's awful. Em <laughs> Emily, you'll figure this out when your kids get a little older, so. <laughs> Um, over to Donna. I think Donna was first and then Paula. Yeah. Hi, Emily. First of all, I think you're the most fascinating person on the planet, uh, <laughs> that Dos Equis should make a gender different one and say, you're the most interesting woman in the world instead of the most interesting man. So <laughs> let's, let's get on yes, Dos Equis yes, to make Emily that memes. happen. Emily memes. Yes. Right now. Um, so I am with you on the old, um, I live in Texas, so I live among the Texas Taliban. And one of the things, um, I know you're supporting governor's races, but I feel like ours in Texas, as long as well as the lieutenant governor's race is probably one of the most important in the country period. Um, so for me, uh, I'm freaking out that they're and I'm in my fifties, so it doesn't matter to me. I'm protecting everybody else's future. And I really love the post you had to your daughter. It made me cry. Um, and the one thing that upsets me is no women have a place to travel and they're getting sniffing dogs to check and see if there's women who are pregnant at the airport so you cannot leave this state. So I feel like there is 
way too much uh, control going on here. And there's 52% women here. And I don't understand in a state of 40 million people how we allow this to happen. So I am applauding you for using your platform in the ways that you are. Uh, I've donated as you have with whatever little funds I do have. Um, I know there is another dog Twitter space I follow that Jason and Chris are really well known with Dr. Jen Goldbeck um, and she has a t-shirt out right now about camping services um, so uh, I'm all about it but I just want to applaud you for using your platform and your show is awesome so I've seen it for years um, with my mother who just recently passed away she got up every Saturday morning to watch you so thank you for all the work that you do on every subject. There's not enough women in STEM and your voice is pretty powerful. Well, Donna, thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. One, I love the potential career pivot from being a children's TV host on Emily's Wonder Lab to being a Dosa Keys uh, sponsored uh, ambassador. <laughs> um, I like that turnaround. Um, and thank you for saying all those things. Texas sounds like a very scary place to be right now. My sister-in-law and brother are living in Missouri, and I know they have plans to leave now. Um, they just moved there, just bought a house, and now they no longer want to live there because of everything that's happening, which is very, very scary. Um, and I'll say about speaking up on my platform, um, somebody in my position is so privileged to have the ability to speak out on this platform uh, or speak out on this topic without too much retribution and too much uh, uh, to lose, I guess. Um, and I feel like I'm somebody who, you know, if I ever needed an abortion, I would be able to travel to a state that allowed one because I have all of the resources to do that. And so many um, people don't have those same resources. And because I have this platform and because I have these resources and because I have this privilege, I feel like it is right my responsibility to be able to use my platform to talk about these issues because so many people who are will be desperate in this situation, don't have that same opportunity to do that. They don't have that same microphone. And so for me, when I'm seeing a lot of other people who have platforms who aren't speaking up about this, it makes me really disappointed. Because, 100%. Yeah, I, I just, it, we have this microphone and I if we are, if we're not speaking up on things like this, about things like Black Lives Matter and anti-Asian hate, then what is this all for? Um, and I think a lot of people have the excuse, well, like my, my platform isn't political. Well, all of us with platforms are making money off of the people who follow us. That is uh -huh. how social media works. And if the people who follow us are losing their lives, are losing their rights, then don't we have a responsibility, um, maybe even just a moral responsibility to speak up on behalf of them? Um, and so I feel that responsibility. I, I, I sort of wish that perhaps other people felt that same responsibility too. hundred percent. And, you know, I, I understand your family went to leave Missouri. Um, I love Texas. I grew up here and I've lived in a bunch of different places in the United States because of work. I feel like I need to stay here and fight. Um, I and I, yeah. and I feel like there's a lot of women here who feel the same way. And if we could just get this governor, uh, if we can just get Beto, um, a lot of things are going to change from guns in Texas to stop banning books. I mean, come on. So, um, we're trying to keep everybody stupid uh, and that's a problem. So I, again, I'm going to mute myself, but I really appreciate what you're doing on your platform besides. Uh, teaching us some really cool stuff every day. <laughs> Everything from children's science to abortion rights. You can get it all here at the Space Gal <laughs> on TikTok, social media. It's a, it's a daunting task, Emily. Um, I just have so much respect for you. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. This, and it's so funny because I think that everybody has their own journey when it comes to like political activism. Um, and I know that I understand the feeling of being nervous and anxious posting about things like this that are controversial. Um, and I will say to anybody who is feeling that anxiety of like wanting to and not really being sure of what to say, the first step is just amplifying other people's voices that resonate with you um, or who have a closer proximity to the situation, um, who need their voices amplified. And then just keep 
trying to talk about this. Um, I wasn't always so easily able to talk about controversial issues on social media. It took a while to do the research and make sure that I felt confident in the words that I am saying. And now my opinions on these topics are not fragile. They are well thought through and they are like, they are, they are strongly convicted. And so I, I feel a bit more confident now than I ever have to talk about these things, but it was a journey. And so if anybody else is feeling nervous about that, just start trying little by little and you too can get more confident to talk about it. Uh, before we get to the next speaker, Emily, did you have to get a bunch of armor though from like being on social media? Like uh, when, when uh, Bunsen and Beaker's account took off and like our Twitter account is nowhere near as big as like your TikTok account, for example. But during the pandemic, we, we talked about vaccines and it was like, whoa, I had to like, I, I had a lot of anxiety about checking my inbox um, during, during that time. But over that time, I've grown like this thick layer of armor where I just don't care. Um, do, are you still affected by, I don't know if this question is good or yeah. not, but like you've had more, you've had experience no, being, question. being in the spotlight and having this, your accounts grow. Yeah. I think a lot of times that feeling comes from being a little bit um, defensive and being nervous that people are being mean to you for someone like myself, who is a, uh, I have like these people pleasing tendencies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't like when other people don't like me. Yeah, exactly. Um, and what I have learned is that when I receive these hateful comments, um, I say to myself, never attribute to malice what can be adequately defined by stupidity. Um, and uh, stupidity might be not that. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, may not be the, the kindest ways to um, refer to that, but I think maybe lack of resources, lack of educational resources is often um, the case. And so I don't take it personally. I just think, you know, mm -hmm. they haven't mm -hmm. had the same education and yep. experiences that I have. And so I don't value their opinion. <laughs> Yeah, that's where, that's where, that's what, I guess that's what I, I'm not as eloquently as you had said is I just don't take it personally anymore. I'm like, they just yes, don't know. Exactly. They don't care. I don't care either. You know, I'll try, <laughs> but you know, if it's hateful, it's, I'm just, I'm just, I don't care. I, it doesn't bother me because they're not really real to me. I don't know. Right. It's tough. It's tough to, I guess. Yeah. You have to make a hierarchy of, of comments that are constructive criticism, mm, yeah. comments that are criticism, but maybe not con constructive. Um, and then comments that are just coming from a place of, you know, I don't understand this problem as well as you do. And therefore I'm going to make a useless comment that you do not need to consider. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's good advice. Thanks, Emily. Mm -hmm. um, we'll go over to Paula and then Dr. M. Hi, Paula. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, Emily. Thank you. Hi. So, so interesting. And I am from Connecticut. We are a safe state. So I, I praise the Lord for that, but um, I can kind of know what you feel. Um, as Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> I know that from that uh, living in here, I, I, I'm not going to get off subject, but I fought something in our town and nobody thought we could do it. And we did. And it was like 80 of us and we changed it. So um, I'm 100 percent behind it. But thank you for being the voice, too, because sometimes we don't know what to say. But then when I see your tweets and stuff, I, I applaud you. So, um, But I'm going to change going back to some science stuff. Uh, when you were in that, I'm I'm curious about this vomit comet. You said you were in <laughs> three times. I'm kind of like, man, I always wanted to do that. But like, what's the height that the plane goes? And and when you were doing it a few more times, did that ever make you want to really space travel? Like, would you, like now there's there are people going up in space and citizens going? Is is would that you know be something of interest to you? And oh yeah, oh my I, gosh, so let cool. me <laughs> tell you, Paula, <laughs> do I ever? <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so the plane flies. I, I believe it's the uh, same altitude as a commercial airplane, around thirty thousand feet or so, maybe a little bit. Um, higher. I'm not totally sure, but, um, around, around that, um, altitude. And yes, I have always wanted to go into space. I was never really sure exactly how I wanted to do it because the job of an astronaut, like a professional NASA astronaut never actually sounded that appealing to me. Um, it's very much like a, a, a regimented, um, job that feels very much like being in the military to me where you have, 
um, this mission to conduct and you have to uh, do it to a T and there's not a lot of like entrepreneurial innovation within that, it seems. You just have to be very, very good at um, doing those tasks. And that never sounded that appealing to me. I I always wanted to be maybe the person deciding what tasks they should be doing. Um, But now with Blue Origin uh, flying people to space, um, I 100% am starting to save to uh, go to space. Um, (laughs) Or at least I was until I started giving all my money away to abortion funds. Um, (laughs) But I will get back to it and I will save. um, But I I definitely 100% believe that I will go to space one day. Um, My eyes are on Blue Origin and I'm hoping that, uh, you know, that day will come sooner rather than later. But yes, I would love to. Oh, that's great. I, I, I envy you. I, I think that's so awesome. And, and uh, <laughs> now that we have the opportunities that we've never, th- I, I never thought citizens would be able to get the chance, but seeing it come to fruition is, is really, it, it's outstanding. I think it's, it's just, so exciting. It's I exciting. I love well, it. Thank, thank you so much. And again, it, it was a pleasure to listen to you and, uh, and thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Paula. Thanks, Paula. Okay, over to Dr. M. Hi, Doc. How's it going? Um, hi, Jason. Hi, Chris. Hi, everybody. Hi, Emily. Thank you for giving hi. us your time. Um, I haven't seen Emily's Wonder Lab, but now that I've met you here, I definitely look forward to checking that out on Netflix and very much excited to do that. You know, I absolutely love Bill Nye Saves the World, and, and it seems that your show, you know, in terms of the impact that it would have on, on our young and in the world in general is along similar lines. And gosh, we could use more of that in the world. I really hope that, um, you know, uh, you were saying there's one season of it out. I really hope that that becomes many seasons. Um, that being said, I just wanted to come up and thank you for the way that you spoke about abortion rights or Maybe if I could um, say it as um, the right to um, medical decision-making autonomy. Um, Specifically, you said um, the question of when life begins is a spiritual question and not a scientific one. And I've never thought about that in that way. And I just really think that's worth a moment of reflection for anyone. Thank you so much for everything that you've shared with us today. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. And I like the way that you put that. autonomy over our own medical decisions. That's a very eloquent way to put that. Thank you. So Chris, uh, if we win the lottery, can I take the dogs to outer space? (laughs) Sure. I think, I think we'd have a little money left over. Like, well, Bunsen's as big as a person, so he's going to need his own seat. So I think that would get kind of expensive. Um, (sighs) But just think of the social media clout we'd get. Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sending dogs to space has not worked super well for the dogs in the past. No, no, no. On uh, History Erased, uh, <laughs> the, the episode that I was on, that's one of the things that I had to study was, ah. the, yeah, kind of the, you know, the sending animals to outer space was good for space exploration and, and very not good for the animals themselves. And not so good for the animals. Yes. No. Yes. Um, a- Emily. Is there anything you can tell us in that you're working on the future? Are you just so focusing on social media um, or is anything yeah. coming in the future kind of hush hush? Like there'll be uh, p- small children uh, in um, uh, black sunglasses coming after me if you say too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, well, I, fun thing that I can share with you that I haven't actually announced yet is that I'm working on the next Ada Lace book. Oh, yeah. Um, Ada Lace has five books in the series so far. They all came out between five and three years ago. Um, the latest one came out three years ago, and we just got picked up for one more book, uh, which is really exciting. And so we are starting to write that book. Uh, that'll be really fun. And then I have a new book that I've written that's done that's coming out in September that's based off of Emily's Wonder Lab, and it's called Stay Curious and Keep Exploring, mm-hmm. which is the tagline from Emily's Wonder Lab. And it has my 50 favorite science experiments. And so that is a really fun activity book for kids um, and hopefully educators and families and homeschoolers and all of that jazz. Um, and that'll come out in September. Uh, and for folks on Twitter spaces, I've pinned that um, up in the nest. So if you're on mobile, you can scroll through that. I believe that's the second thing I pinned in the nest. Um, and then, yeah, there's a couple things about stay curious and keep exploring. 
So we'll look forward to that in September, hey? Yep, that's okay, right. Okay, all right. <laughs> Well, we're going to wrap up. Um, we'll keep things to a crisp one hour. Um, I know some other people have wanted to speak, but Emily's very busy and uh, an hour of your time is super generous. Emily, thank you for being our guest today. Yeah, thank you all for having me. Make sure you follow Emily on Twitter, but Emily, you're also on Instagram and TikTok. That's right. Yep. And Facebook. And Facebook. Where all right. the drama is happening. So oh, the drama llama it, stuff. <laughs> yeah. You, you can go ahead and follow me there too. Okay. So find Emily everywhere, folks. Emily is taking over the world, which it wouldn't be a bad thing. <laughs> I'll do my best, guys. I'll do my best. Okay. Take care, Emily. Anything you need uh, on Twitter? I mean, our TikTok account, it isn't super big, but our Twitter account's doing all right. Anything you need uh, augmented or retweeted, let us know. We'll help you out. Love you guys. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. And, and uh, we'll wrap up our space. Emily had to go. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here today. Uh, there we go. I got my wrap-up music going. <laughs> um, this was a special, uh, special edition of Science Chat. Uh, this was really the only time that it worked for Emily, and she was gracious enough to be our guest today. So tomorrow at 5 o'clock Eastern, we're having a special pet chat space with a dog trainer, um, Christine Young. So if you, well, I'll try and get the ad going for that as soon as possible. <laughs> um, but if you have questions about training your pet or just want to listen to an expert dog trainer chat on Twitter, she's going to be our guest tomorrow in a special edition of Pet Chat. Um, please make sure you follow Emily. She's amazing. Check out her books, Ada Lovelace, I believe they're called. Hopefully I got that right. And her new book, Stay Curious and Keep Exploring. You could have been anywhere, but you were here in our space today, so thank you for doing that. Uh, Chris, anything to say as we close? No. Uh, well, yes, of course. This was an amazing space, and I really appreciate um, everything that Emily said and shared with us. Um, I'm definitely going to be using her science experience, uh, experiments in my class next year um, as I flip my classroom into even more of a hands-on experience. Yeah. Although I did that before, it's going to be just so much more now because I have my experience of online teaching, and I'm going to bring all this stuff um, to get the kids engaged and excited in science. I'm just so stoked about how my live class is going to look <laughs> next year. Yeah, teaching, so, so. teaching kids with hands-on activities is the way to go. At any point you can do it, man, it's, it's way more engaging than me sitting up at the front of the classroom and going wah, wah, wah. So, yeah. The, yeah, the talking head at the front. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's Sometimes no I have longer. to do that in chemistry. Like when we cover redox reactions that take an entire page to calculate, there's really no hands-on activity for that. It's like time to learn some science, children. So, but No hippos is what I called it in high school. No hippos? What? Yeah. I don't know. That's what we did with the redox table because, like, I don't know. Just never mind. Okay. Well, we're okay. rambling. I think it's time to wrap up. Okay, take care, everybody. Okay. We'll see you. Talk to you later. Bye. You know, sometimes... Bye-bye. Press... Thanks, everyone. No problem. Bye. Some... Sometimes I try to press end and it doesn't work on my phone. Oh, there it goes.